This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. <laughs> this is a show about science. Oh, oh my God. By scientists. Tonight, Don't worry, keep moving, keep moving. Techno in Search of the Great American Prairie. We're in the prairie state, yet ironically, we have such little of it left. Farming and overdevelopment killed it. Now, get ready for this. An explosion of color and the return of these native animals. How many plant species do you have in here? But volunteers trying to bring back one of the planet's most complex ecosystems ran into trouble. We just needed something that helped to level the playing field. Why a certain animal from America's past was needed to pull off the impossible. We've just arrived at the Nachusa grassland, and I'm seeing these bison for the first time. Marita Davison is an environmental biologist. Tonight, a trip to the heartland. Oh, there's a baby. Kira Santa Maria is a neuroscientist. I'm Phil Torres. I'm an entomologist. The epic drought of 2015 takes a hidden toll. From above, these trees may look green and healthy. They're not. Here we see something that's uh, dramatically different. Now the technology that can see what we can't. That's our team. I'm a prairie barber. Now let's do some science. Hey guys, welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Kara Santa Maria and Marita Davison. And today we're going to talk two environmental stories. And to start off, the Great American Prairie. To me, it's one of those iconic images of how the U.S. used to be. Unfortunately, now it's almost entirely just a part of our history. Yeah, there's been a lot of overdevelopment of farming and a suburban explosion that's really taken a toll on a lot of prairie ecosystems. Illinois has been extremely hard hit. It's changing, but there's been a big change in the landscape there. Yeah, and this is happening across the United States. But I got to say, what I really love about this story is that it's a bit of a twist. So there is. I don't want to give anything away. So let's go about 90 miles outside of Chicago, where they're bringing back a little piece of history. It's, it's kind of a big piece of history. OK, a big piece of history. It's a good one. You are looking at a 3,500-acre experiment in a growing field known as restoration ecology. This is the Nachusa Grasslands Preserve in Franklin Grove, Illinois, 90 miles west of Chicago where the Nature Conservancy is rolling back time, 200 years, to restore a tall grass prairie that was almost extinct. We're in the prairie state, yet ironically, we have such little of it left. Uh, at the time of European settlement, about two thirds of the state, some 20, 25 million acres of the state, was tall grass prairie. We have less than one one hundredth of one percent of the native prairie that's still intact. The mission is being overseen by three Illinois natives. Jeff Walk, director of science for the Nature Conservancy, project director Bill Kleinman, and restoration ecologist Cody Considine. It was a, a vast landscape uh, dominated by those grasses, but the real diversity of the prairie was in the, the wildflowers, the forbs, the broadleaf plants, and thousands of species of insects, and dozens of birds and mammals and reptiles that called the prairie home, along with animals like the bison. What was once this vast landscape across much of Illinois has been virtually eliminated and turned into the Corn Belt. But Illinois isn't alone. Since the late 1800s, prairie grasslands across the United States have been steadily vanishing. I've heard grasslands in general referred to as the unheralded counterparts of the rainforest. And grasslands have a critical role in terms of climate change as well. In a prairie, most of that carbon is stored in the soil, and so it's very secure for very long-term storage as soil organic matter. In essence, the plants of the tall grass prairie absorb carbon dioxide, trapping it in their deep roots. The restoration began in 1986, growing from a small plot of remnant prairie, land that had never been farmed. 
And starting with fire, the process hasn't changed much in 30 years. It's completely fire dependent. Without fire, we could not have prairie. The vegetation grows more vigorously. Most species of plants have a, a season of more intense blooming right after either the first year or the second year after a fire. No one knows that transition better than restoration ecologist Cody Considine. Cody, we're standing in what looks to me at least two very different types of areas. What happened here? So yeah, so we're right on the line of uh, two different prairie restorations. Uh, the one right here was planted two years ago and the one behind us was planted uh, three years ago. And so what we're seeing is as these prairie restorations um, get older, more plants emerge, they get more mature, they're flowering, uh, so they're quite dynamic. How many plant species do you have in here? Uh, for this particular planting, I believe we had 130 species, uh, ranging from, here's a native western sunflower, this is a clonal species. We have rattlesnake master here, we have grassleaf goldenrod here, we have an, an echinacea here, a pale purple cone flower. It's already flowered. All those bloomers started here. All right, so this is the seed room. Yep. Project director, Bill Kleiman. Well, you might think that the prairie seed would find its way out into these former cornfields, but it doesn't walk very fast. So we would have to wait millennia, whereas we can collect the seed from the remnant prairies, bring it out to a cornfield that we're retiring, plant it, and it'll grow that year. Do you have a sense of how many seeds you and the volunteers here have planted over the years? About 250 species a year. So it's, it's millions and millions of seeds. Conventional wisdom was to plant 10 pounds of seeds per acre, but Bill ordered 50 pounds and the fields blossomed. None of it would be possible without a core of volunteers like Jay Stacy. So what are you cutting today? This particular forb is called Prairie Coreopsis scientific name Coreopsis palmata. How long have you been doing this? I've been doing this as my 21st year. I'm a prairie barber. All the tall grass planting was a little too successful. We just needed something that helped to level the playing field. What they needed was something to thin out the grass like an enormous vacuum. The solution? Not a Dyson, but a herd of bison. A posse of 800 pound grazing machines. We've just arrived at the Nachusa grassland and I'm seeing these bison for the first time and I feel like I've just been transported back 150, 200 years, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty remarkable to see these enormous animals that were almost wiped out from North America. Oh, there's a baby. There's a little one. Oh, a couple of them. Bison have been part of the vision for the project since the very beginning, uh, but it's taken us close to 30 years to be able to put together enough of a landscape where it was a practical consideration for us. These iconic bison were the missing link for a massive restoration of this endangered tall grass prairie run by the Nature Conservancy. Would you say that they have been a game-changing factor here? Oh yeah, it, these animals are gonna make a difference on this prairie. I hitched a ride with Nachusa Project Director Bill Kleiman and restoration ecologist Cody Considine to track down the bison in their 500-acre grazing area. Why are the bison so important to the restoration process? Bison eat grass, and they're, the disturbances they're creating puts diversity on the landscape. As they graze, the nutrients are going in one end and it's coming out the back end, so you're getting a very quick nutrient cycling on the prairie. Those bison patties are spreading seeds and fertilizing the soil. What's the average weight of a full-size bison? The cows can range from 800 to 1,100 pounds, and the bulls, as they mature, they can get up to 2,000 pounds. Massive. So how many bison do we have on the, on the reserve? It's 30 adults 
and 16 calves. The calf was just born last week, a little tiny one. It could easily pick it up. It's pretty exciting to think about the calf being born on Illinois prairie. That hasn't happened for probably 200 years. What happened to bison here? There was a tremendous slaughter of bison in the 1870s and 1880s. Jeff Walk is the chief scientist for the Illinois chapter of the Nature Conservancy. It's estimated by the turn of the 1900s, there were probably 400 to 1,000 animals that had persisted out of that massive herd of 30 to 60 million. That's close to extinction. It's absolutely close to extinction. There was definitely a market for the hides, for the meats. Uh, also, part of it is that it was uh, encouraged by the U.S. government as, as a strategy to help reduce the food supply for the Native Americans in the conflict with the Native American peoples. It's estimated there are about 400,000 bison now in North America. But most of those bison were bred with cattle for meat production. Only about 20,000 are pure American bison. That genetic line dates back to 1913, when 14 bison from the Bronx Zoo were trucked to Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota at the behest of Teddy Roosevelt. So when it was time to bring bison to Nechusa, they looked for a posse with a Wind Cave lineage. Okay. We went to Broken Kettle Grassland, uh, another Nature Conservancy preserve in northwestern Iowa in October of 2014, uh, and brought back 20 animals with us. We essentially separated off the animals that uh, we were going to bring back to Illinois, made sure that they had a clean bill of health. Seven of the females we strapped GPS collars onto so that we can get near real-time movements of the animals. Tracking those movements with the GPS collars is Julia Brockman, a bison researcher at Southern Illinois University. What kind of data are you receiving? So we're getting location information, a GPS point on a map every hour, 24 hours a day. So can you show me what you've been seeing? Sure. These are the bison locations for yesterday. They seem to be spending a lot of time along their corral and trap pasture. And I can corroborate that because we were there and we saw them there, so cool. What would you say is the ultimate goal of your study? Having that amount of data really changes how we look at their movements and their selection. It helps to understand what type of habitat they'll like for reintroductions in the future. Among the two dozen scientists doing research at Nechusa is Dr. Holly Jones, a conservation biologist at Northern Illinois University. With her team, she's trapping and tagging small mammals to assess the impact of the big bison. It's a completely a restoration ecologist playground. I get so excited about this field site. Let's see if someone's in there. There is. Small mammals are food for aerial predators, things like hawks, things like owls. And so it's really important to know how they're doing um, to be able to say how the prairie's doing as a whole. And that's because if the small mammals are tasty enough to become good prey, they are feasting on a healthy environment of insects and plants. What are you seeing? Since bison have been introduced, we've had 13 line ground squirrels, which was very surprising. The line of evidence is pointing towards a, a shift in community composition. There are different plots of lands that have been restored at you know, different times. From all the way back to 20 years ago, we can look at a plot of land like this that was restored four years ago and look at a plot of land over there that was restored six years ago, and in one season, look at how restoration progresses. Good tag, mm -hmm. it beeps. So. Now we thank him for his science and send him on his way. You can't, buddy, you can go. There you go. Less than a year since the bison's arrival, the environmental impact is subtle. Some changes to plant growth and small animal populations. But the biggest change may be on humans. People are very connected to this herd, and they still feel like these are their bison. This is such a cool thing that we've returned this iconic mammal to Illinois. Uh, it's exciting. I gotta say, I love when you guys bring stuff back from the field, especially from someplace as iconic as Tallgrass Prairie. So, Marita, what did you bring us? All right, first, Phil, you gotta stand up. Okay. Tell me how tall you are. I'm about 6'2". Okay, so here is 
a tall grass from the tall grass prairie. That wow. is some tall grass. <laughs> it's tall. I mean, I was literally swimming in this stuff. You this know, is this amazing. Is, this is part of the vegetation we're talking and about. And this is what the bison munch on. This is that's exactly what they munch on. This is what the bison were brought in to help control. I could use um, some of this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now. These are little seed pods. They look like uh, musical instruments, but they're seed pods of some of the vegetation on the prairie. Got a nice little ring to them. <laughs> I like it. And this is what they've been using to replant some of the native vegetation. And, and then lastly, this, this is the last piece of the puzzle. This is bison fur. No <laughs> Check <way. laughs> Oh, it's surprisingly soft. Yeah, and you can see there's stuff in there. There's so, a lot of stuff in here. So you can see really easily how bison would be dispersing, you know, these these little seed, well, these large seed dispersers across the prairie. Right. I like, this is even kind of shaped like a bison. Well, when I was looking at that footage, I was blown away by the color in the prairie, the biodiversity, the flowering plants. And I wonder if a lot of people have that preconceived notion that nothing grows out there. Well, would, if I told you, Kara, mm -hmm. that along with tropical rainforests, prairie lands and other grasslands are the most biodiverse complex ecosystems in the world, would you believe me? I mean, I believe you because you are an expert. It's, tr <laughs> it's, it's totally true. But it does blow my mind. You know, I thought it was really interesting to learn how important the prairie land is here in America for, you know, this big climate change problem that we're all facing. These, these grasses and these different plants actually act as kind of a carbon sink, don't they? They really do. The bulk of the plants in the prairie are not above ground, they're underground, because that's how they survive fire. They actually are a big factor in uh, storing carbon. Yeah, and that really does feed into the very next story. Marita and Phil, you guys tag teamed a little bit, right? Both from the sky and from the ground. Yeah, I got to see California forests from an airplane like no other. And while you were in your flying laboratory, I was on the ground seeing the reality of trees and what's taking them down. This drought is so epic, it's so out of the norm that we actually don't have an answer to what can we expect long term? California's epic drought. Reservoirs are near empty, farmers herding, and its forests are aflame or under attack by opportunistic pests. So we're seeing tree mortality all over the landscape. But in order to understand these changes to forests, scientists must first assess their health using field observations and airplanes. We have the most advanced airborne remote sensing package that I know of on Earth today. For over a decade, ecologist Greg Asner has been monitoring the health of forests around the world in an aircraft called the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. Techno profiled his work mapping the Amazon in a previous episode. This time, we joined him on his latest effort to map drought-plagued California forests in his tricked-out Dornier 228. In the back of the aircraft are unique sensors designed to take measurements of the forest canopy while the plane flies over it. We're flying over about 8 million trees per hour. One of these instruments is known as LIDAR. This instrument is a laser system that fires two lasers out of the bottom of the plane in a pattern that images the forest canopy or whatever it is that we fly over in 3D. What the instruments do is provide us a very accurate very unique way of understanding the amount of carbon stored in California's forests. If you don't put carbon in forests, then it ends up in the atmosphere, and that contributes to climate change. The plane is also equipped with a pair of spectrometers used to detect the chemical composition of trees. It was time for takeoff. Where are we going today? Today we're heading out pretty close to the Oregon border, where we have a lot of forest that's unknown in terms of its drought stress. And with that, we were off. From the air, we could see reservoirs and rivers clearly depleted of water. Lake Shasta Reservoir? That's right. It's a lot of water missing when you see that much brown. But the forest canopy actually looks pretty green. To the naked eye here, they look like they're in pretty good shape. The majority of California's forests are under drought stress today. My guess is that most of these forests are in trouble. Back at the lab, Asner's team got to work analyzing all the data. That's where Techno's Phil Torres picks up the story. So you did a flight with Marita. These are the results. And looking out the cockpit, it looked green. But here we see something that's uh, dramatically different. And what do you see? 
we see that the forest is, varies from what we would consider pretty average conditions in the yellows and the blues up there down to areas that look severely drought stricken in red. Next, we looked at an area where the drought stress was more acute. So this is from Los Padres National Forest. This is what it looks like when you fly over. Gray green looks like your typical Southern Cal forest. This is what it looks like in chemical detail. Those trees are doing okay, but everything else is showing severe drought stress, and that's showing here in red. Now that we have the view from above, we decided to head out for a boots on the ground perspective. I'm standing here in the middle of Los Padres National Forest, and as you could tell from all the dead trees behind me, there's plenty of evidence of the impact of a multi-year drought. One of the biggest problems here, a bug that attacks water-stressed pine trees. Now we're talking. Oh, there's a bunch. Tom Coleman is an entomologist with the U.S. Forest Service. There's a lot of dead trees right here. Yeah, this is a nice little active spot. Bark beetles. Bark beetles kill more trees than any other kind of insect or disease in North America. When you just look across the landscape and you see this kind of patchwork of, of dead trees. Mortality is quite dramatic. This tree here is full of thousands of bark beetles. Does that mean that all the trees around here are now susceptible? Right now, from what I've seen, it's just basically across the entire landscape. Have you ever seen it this bad? Not here in California. So just 10 minutes away, we were looking at the devastation caused by the pine beetles, and now we are here, and you can see the damage done by forest fires. So there's a lot going on here. So even though the wildfire has actually gone through an area and caused major mortality, we'll still see bark beetles coming in afterwards. Scientists studying our forest are concerned about the impacts from drought, not just in California, but also around the world. Now what we're starting to worry about is whether these droughts are somehow all interrelated and linked at a global scale. So it seems a lot of forests of the world are in trouble. Droughts putting pressure on them. We don't know exactly how much of the global forest cover is at risk, but we're in that process now of finally getting the measurements we need to make those predictions. These scientists that are studying these things, they could say, here's the problem, but their hands are tied. They, all they can do is wait for the drought to be over, for El Nino to pass, and try to influence management and policy. They need to get the data into the right hands. I think that's the plan. It has to get into the hands of managers and decision makers so that they can actually implement changes. And whether we're talking about managing America's grasslands or America's forests, one thing is for certain, that if we have healthy ecosystems, we will eventually have a healthier climate. Absolutely, and thank you for the stories today, guys. Now, from prairie being restored by bison to forest being decimated by beetles, one thing's for sure, it's a complex ecosystem out there, but there's a lot of scientists working hard on it. That's it for now. We'll see you next time here on Techno. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and more.